praise God. We're going to maybe do a lot of introductions, I guess. It probably goes past the Bob. Knows him by now, I'm sure. Yeah. Who? Did, did no. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew there would be one. There had to be at least one before it tells everyone. I'm just going to have Pastor yeah. Bob come on up here and just get the word tonight. Amen. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. I had one of those already. Yeah, of course. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you very much. much. That's everything I. Um, you have a uh, when you can, and this is not the takeaway from your scene, but when it's you, there's a presence on your worship, and it's not takeaway from the team at all. So all team members don't get mad at you, okay? Uh, there, there's a presence, and I just really thank you. Thank you very much. I know you got to go. So go see your daughters. Amen. Amen. Well, <coughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, all week I've been building me and Rob, right? That's for Rob and I. Uh, but I got a phone call over today. I can't make it. But I have a sermon built for two. We practice the quickening in our church. So tonight's a quickening. <laughs> And just want to let you know that those of you that are in our church, that there's always the quickening. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I could, I could choose Pastor Mike, because he's always prepared, right? He's, he's, he's got a good work, but he already preached, he preached a little hard out the other night, exhausted all that he had. <laughs> Pastor Tim, excellent word last night. Just yes. preached his heart out, took us to a new level, and really good. And then, and then I have, have people in my church, you know, that, that preach really well, you know, that are good. They're really good. That a quickening, see, my church is used to that. They're living under the quickening the second year. And the quickening, exactly, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, is God showed us last year the quickening is a, a point that we're all, the word says if you're born again in Mark, you're, you have a responsibility to the kingdom. And your responsibility is to preach the gospel. Pastor Tim, I did on that last night. And so the Lord instructed us last year about that and how we're supposed to be quick. You see, I can, I can pick on any one of my people and hand them off the mic. And I know they'd be ready. They'd be ready. But instead, I pick the novice. Someone that... You know, I know that I can help him grow in his in his in his teaching of the word, and I know that it will it's, it's pushing things and stretching things, but I know he's going to step up to the task. Pastor Jack and I are tight. Yeah. Yeah. If he had the opportunity to do the same thing, he's going to have the opportunity tonight. So we've never done this before, and this is literally an hour and a half ago decision. He looked through the nose, but I'm excited, and he dressed for the occasion. And I decided this was the quickest thing I know. <laughs> But we've got a word for you tonight. He hasn't seen it, but we've got a word for you. <laughs> uh, no, I, <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't have got it. I did look at this one. Yeah. I did look at these notes, but they were way beneath my level, so. <laughs> <laughs> it should be fun tonight. I did promise fun last night, right? Yes. I didn't realize the fun part was going to be on me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, and first, we're going to start off with. Um, is first in John chapter 1, verse 5. We've heard this week about the victorious church and the glorious church. But a lot of times when you say that word out there about the church, you get all this negative vibe back. You get this, it's like a dark fog over the church. No, I don't want to do a church. But here's what the word says in uh, John chapter 1, verse 5. says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, our job tonight is to give you some um, 
It's going to take works with our faith to get there. And it's going to take our faith operating with the works of the company to accomplish what God wants us to do there. We're not going there to, uh, like last time, and have a vacation, you know? Like, we're not going there like last time and just relax and not have any action out there. We're going there to put some, some uh, power to the people of God. You know, he says, faith without works today. He goes on to say, but someone who says, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. It takes a lot more when you say, I'm going to accomplish this. I'm trusting God for this. I'm believing God for this. And you step out and head that direction. It takes a lot of faith to step, take that first step out and say, I'm going to do this. It's like everybody in our church that preaches now, just about everybody in our church does preaching. Well, it took a, me a, me a measure of faith on their part, but it took them stepping out to accomplish that bit. You know, Sheila uh, came in one Sunday. The guy had been working on it. I remember it was an offering teaching she did. She came in on Sunday, and when she got the other offering, she says, I believe I'm called to preach. Now, she could have said, I believe I'm called to preach, and left it at that and never did nothing more. But instead, we gave her the opportunity, she took the opportunity, and she stepped into it and knocked it out of the park. That's, that's true of anyone that says, I have faith, God's told me to do this. Then you've got to put more than just words to it. You've got to put some action to it. You know, I'm new to the quickening conference and some of the teaching, so hopefully I'll stay on track where we're supposed to go. But it says in Hebrews 11, 6, that without faith it's impossible to please Him, right? He that cometh, God must believe that he is, and his reward those abilities who seek him. Without faith, you can't please God. And I've heard it mentioned before that faith pleases God. I don't necessarily believe that. Well, let the ear suck back in the room. <laughs> faith is not what pleases God. It's what you do with your faith. Because the Word says, God says in the Word, I believe it's James says, you ask, or it's, uh, John says, you ask and you have not, because you ask according to your your lust. You want to spend it on your own lust. We're well, asking in faith, but you ask for the wrong thing and the wrong motivation. <coughs> it's not necessarily faith that pleases God. It's what you do with your faith. And we as believers are called to do something in these end times. And so quickening is, as I'm hearing Pastor Bob describe it, would mean that God's drawing on you to get involved in what He's doing. What is this vision for the end times? <coughs> And of course, uh, I understand God's end time vision is the same for every Christian. He's called us to go into the glory. Yes. Uh, I teach all the time in my church on Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk says in chapter 2, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I'll watch to see what he will send me and what I shall answer when I'm approved. Verse 3 says, The Lord answered me. He said, Write the vision, make, make it plain upon tables. He never read it. Well, the vision yet from from a point at from a point in time, but the end shall speak and not lie. Though we turn and wait for it. Now that's the first three verses. So he says there's a vision, whoever reads us to run towards that. I'm, I'm skipping going to it for the sake of time. But in verse 14 he says, here's the vision that every Christian should be running for toward in the end time. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord's waters of the sea again. You want to know what God wants you to do with your faith? Get involved in the church, get involved in what he's doing to usher in the glory of God. Now here's another thing. Faith is designed to access supernatural power. So God doesn't want you just trying to do some good deeds. He wants you to use your faith to access strength, wisdom, finances, supernatural love. I know someone wrote a book on that. Uh, <laughs> Which we have signed copies of it. <laughs> that God wants us to use our faith to access this anointing, this power, this glory He's made available. As we bring that into the earth, that's what He's pleased in. Just because you may do a few good deeds because you think God's been happy because you blessed somebody, uh, He's after much more than that. He wants you to use your faith to do what nobody else can do of their own natural ability. And the glory is the main thing He's targeting. So that quickening is to bring you into that glory of God, as Pastor Bob mentioned. Uh, shall I keep speaking? Are you ready? I'm always ready, but I just, I'm listening. I'm happy. Okay, Isaiah chapter 60. One of my favorite passages. How many of you 
me like Isaiah 60. Mm -hmm. I, I know you've studied this in here. Verse 1 says, Arise and shine for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. I'm after the glory. A few nights ago, I don't want to take all Pastor Bob's time. Actually, last Friday night, we do all night prayer at my, at my church every Friday night. And last Friday night, it was probably about 2 in the morning or so. Uh, I've been praying for a while. I sat on the couch. I said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. And he said, what do you want me to do in your church? What do you want, you know, for your church? Oh, my goodness, God, I have a list. <laughs> and I said, well, I would like to see our numbers go way up. I want to see people in every service. He said, why? Well, God, because the church should grow. You know, we're supposed to have a lot of people in the building. And plus, the more people come in, the more people I can teach the word, and the more finances will flow into the church, the more we can do. He says, why? And I guess he asked me about six or seven times why. So finally, I got down to the answer I believe he was asking. And I said, Lord, because we can teach the people how to usher in the glory of God. And he quit asking why. Amen. Well, a little bit later, I was, I'd gone back to the couch, a group of us were there by this time, and I had, I, I call it a vision, really I saw in my spirit, I was looking out, my eyes were open, but I saw in, in our sanctuary, uh, about seat high, a giant cutting board. It was made of trench loose like plastic. My wife has one home, not that big, but it covered all the seats in the sanctuary, kind of extended beyond. But it was made up of jagged pieces. And the jagged pieces had been totally fused together into a giant cutty hole. There were no gaps. And I said, God, what is this? He says, this is your people I've fused together as a foundation for the glory. He said, you don't need more people. Teach the ones you have. They'll usher in the glory. They'll bring in the harvest. So this quickening is on the people who have a heart for God to do what's necessary to position their church, their lives, to bring in that power in these end times. So again, I'm going to read another few verses in this. I'm going to pass it off. I'm going to take the time. I'm used to that. <laughs> God says the glory of God is going to rise upon us. Then he says, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth and grow darkness the people. Well, I know this glory is not meant then. A lot of people want to put this passage over the millennial reign of Christ and the thousand year reign of peace. There'll be no gross darkness during that time. At least not for the majority of it. This has got to be for today. And gross darkness has filled the earth right now. Look at what's taking place in America right now, worldwide right now. People are listening to lies like never before. And defending lies and depend. Can I just say defending stupidity? But that's the result of gross darkness. You think, why don't they see? Because the enemy has blinded their minds. They can't see. Now we just read in, in, in John a while ago how the light shined, but the darkness didn't comprehend it. I want to know today, we're seeing miracles in the church like never before. Never before. Pastor Callan just got back from Peru, saw nine sets of blind eyes open at one time. We're singing my church miracle after miracle, healing after healing. And you wonder, why is the church failed? It's because gross darkness has blinded men's eyes. And they either want to be blinded or have their ears tickled, which is probably what I'm going to talk about tomorrow night, Sunday morning. This move that the enemy sowed into, into the world when people want to accept these watered down gospels. <coughs> Amen. It's just a feel-good gospel and just know that God loves you. There's more to it. The quickening requires internal change. So when I saw that cutting board, God said that represented. I asked him, why is it a cutting board? He said, because your people will let me cut on them. I'm not talking about cutting harmful. I'm talking about cutting away stuff out of their life. Shaping, reforming, redirecting their activities. So this verse fills the earth. He goes on and it says... And the Gentiles, let me finish verse 2 first. And gross darkness of the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. I always confess, your glory comes upon me. I want the glory. I've been in the glory. There is, there is nothing on earth that touches being in the glory. 
I was in the glory one time. Now, this has been probably 10 or 15 years ago. I was in the glory one time for almost two weeks. I thought I'd done it. I, I made it to the glory. And I thought, praise God. I was so caught up. I couldn't, I couldn't hardly function in the natural. And after two weeks, it lifted. I said, God, what did I do wrong? Where did I miss it? How come the glory's gone? It lifted. His presence was still there. The anointing was there, but not the glory. He said, you didn't do anything wrong. I was giving you a taste of what's to come to the church in these end times. If you buy my book, it'll teach you how to. <laughs> the glory is coming to those that will let God move in their life and shift their priorities and what they're doing and bring them quicker. Now, it says the light shines in the darkness and comprehended. How come of all the miracles we're seeing and the revelation God's bringing forth right now? Aren't people flocking to the churches? Because the gross darkness does not comprehend the outcome of light. Genesis in verse 3, look at this. And the Gentiles shall show up thy light, and kings of the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about to see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee, thy son shall come from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Here's what I want to get at. We have tried to put evangelism above seeking the glory many times. And God kept asking me, why do you want people if, 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 if they're not going to go anywhere? What's he's having an army if they're, not, if they're not directed to do something of a, of a phenomenal fashion for God? He's calling people to the glory. And it says when we go into the glory, even though the darkness is there, it will still bring in the harvest because that light of the glory will disperse the darkness off many. And of course, then it says the funds are going to come, the harvest is going to come, the authority is going to come. It all comes out of the people seeking the power of God in these end times. Can I go one more verse? Look at Matthew chapter 24. In 1992, no, 94, Mr. Somerville came to our church in Lexington. And he taught us probably for an hour and a half, two hours. And a lot of it was over here and over there. We didn't know where he was going next. But he, he went to this verse, and of his entire message, this is the one thing I remember. Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus speaking about the end times. And in verse 14 he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Now I mean the end for us is the rapture. Do you follow me? But he says the gospel is going to be preached in all nations. Well listen, I believe it already has been as, as far as the gospel. Most people in the world have heard about Jesus, and most nations have heard the gospel. But it doesn't say the gospel should be heard in all nations. It says the gospel of the kingdom. That through faith you can bring the kingdom to earth and have the promises of God today. Amen. We've heard about salvation everywhere. You can't go anywhere they don't hear about salvation. But they've not seen the dead being raised, the blind eyes opening, the sick being healed. Oh, the power of God being poured out. The glory of God. And that's what God is quickening us for. The man of this is in time. How it could be just a playtime church. And I know your pastor. I know Pastor Bob. And I know they're not they are not going to be satisfied with just building a congregation. It's got to be after the first Amen. 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 That leads right into where the Matthew 25 right here, right there. You're welcome. Yes. By the Spirit. By the Spirit. By the Spirit. Chapter 25, Jesus is continuing that thought about the church. Let's pick it up in verse 31. Now, in this part, Jesus is talking about how the nations will be judged. Now, listen to this. The nations will be judged. And I've heard some great teaching on this, and I wish I could, I could recall it right now. I can't. But this is what he says here in verse 31. It says, And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, 
And he will separate, th separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I remember, I think back uh, when Deb and I first started, uh, back in the 70s, when the Lord really first started pricking our hearts about the things of God. And every once in a while, I'll hear something from back then. I'll, I'll, I'll see a song from back then. I'll hear a song from the early Christian days. And I'll think about, I wish I would have been a part of that. I wish I could have been there in the beginning of the Jesus movement. I wish I would have been a hippie and been able to come out of that. Okay? But well, what I'm saying is, is that I was too young. <laughs> I was just ahead of my time. Pastor <laughs> Tim, you want to kick in on this? But uh, what I'm saying, what, what I mean to say there is that there is a <laughs> there is a group. And there is a group that's going to be separated. Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen when he comes in his glory. He's going to separate the, the nations as if it were, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, a goat nation is one that is turned away from God. Now, we can narrow this down to goat people. Okay, I want to look at right people. Look like goats. <laughs> but we're, we're all sheep in here anyway, right? Right. But the thing is, is there are people that are living a life that a goat would, that would qualify here. He goes on to say now, uh, and, and then there are the sheep. He goes on to say here in verse 33, And he will send his sheep, on his, take the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you uh, visited me. And I was in prison, and you came to me. Then, uh, they, then, they, then they answered, when did we do this? See, there's no, there was no, that doesn't say anything about faith here, does it? It says that you, I was this, and you did that. I was here and you did that. There's nothing about faith. Now, Pastor Joe has, has spent years in prison ministry. And, uh, and, 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 and he would be able to tell you that that type of Pastor Mike worked with prison ministry. We've done some prison ministry. That type of ministry takes some work. It takes faith, too. It takes faith to be in Pontiac prison. I was like I was one time as a ministry. And, and, and in the segregated population, and then they have a, uh, a fight break out, somebody gets stabbed in one of the cell blocks, and they shut it down, and in five minutes you're out of the prison, box, stock, and barrel. Yeah. It takes faith, but it also takes more faith. Well, I want to do that. I want to do prison. Prison ministry sounds so <coughs> fun, doesn't it? Well, wait a minute. Hold it. Tra traveling the world as a missionary, going to, you know, go to, the, go to those countries and, 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 and see the places and... And everything. Isn't that sound like fun? I mean, hey, Belgium's nice. We went on a mission trip to Belgium. It's nice. Brussels, Belgium's nice. Well, it was until they started bombing it. You know, the thing is, this God is nice. But this God, it's work. It takes faith to go there, but it takes work when you get there. And see, out here, there's a lot of goats. In here, we're sheep. We're not better than them. We're just doing what he's asked us to do. What we want, my purpose for this whole message tonight is to give you three things. One is you need to be doing something for the kingdom. Yourself, you're not, you're not working for your salvation. You can't buy that. You can't work for that. But you've got to be working in the kingdom. You've got to be doing something. These people here, in all essence, in this here, the sheep, they were about the Father's business. You remember that when Jesus was... Uh, Laid back for about three days, and the parents finally found out he was gone. Man, I don't know. Do you classify them? Do you turn them into DCFS because they were? He was three days down the journey, and they forgot that he was even with wasn't with them. But when he came, when they came back and they found him, and he said, when they said, well, "Where have you been?" He says, "Why are you so shocked that you find me here? Why are you so shocked that I'm about my father's business?" At 13 years old, Jesus was about. His father's business. I see young people all the time in our church growing up. Our, our desire is that our children in our church 
our ceiling of our spiritual walk, our ceiling of our lives, is their floor which they launch from. And the only way that happens successfully is if we, the adults of today, are about the Father's business. Yeah. I was telling Debbie, I was listening to an old song on uh, old 70s, early Christian song this week, was out doing something, I said, I said, you know, the venue for these guys here wasn't real strong. They had to go into the small churches. They had to maybe do some street concerts. They had, not the venues that the Christian concerts are today. Not the, they, didn't have the, they didn't have the radio stations then that they have today. Yeah. But they were about the Father's business. There's an old song by Honey Tree, Nancy Honey Tree. If you look her up on YouTube, if you don't know who she is, she's one of the pioneers of, of Christian music. And it's called Pioneer. That was the song called Pioneer. And in the, in the lyrics, if I can gain the lyrics right, maybe Vince can correct me if I get it wrong, is that it says that the, the road, I'm just paraphrasing, the road you're paving is hard, it's laborious, but you've got to keep moving forward because the people behind you is going to be straighter for them, it's going to be seemingly more glorious for them, but it says you're paving the way, you're a pioneer. I want to be a pioneer. I want to be someone that is about the Father's business at a level that I'm not surprised by anything he asks me to do. Because he knows, there, there's an old, there's an old uh, adage that says, if you want something done, find a busy person, they'll get it done for you. Because they know how to get things done, no matter what, how many things they're juggling. And that's what I want to be in the kingdom. I want to be one of those people, not about just doing things to be doing things. I want to affect the world for the kingdom. That's what ministry is to me. That's what it's all about. I yeah, preaching's fun, it's nice, I like it. Teaching I love. But the thing is, is I don't do it because I like it. To be real honest with you, I like sitting on a beach somewhere, soaking in the sun. I like I like that. But you know, I can't be like Robin if they go and sit on the beach and soak in the sun all the time. I have to be about, I, I, and, 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 but God has other plans for my life. Deb and I love doing things, and we love being, and, and I wasn't, I mean, I sold the insurance for 20 some years. And as I sold the insurance, I tell people, someday you're going to be, you know, that's, that's what someone in their middle 40s, you know, wants a 20 year old to tell them, you're going to be old someday. You're going to need Social Security. <laughs> you're going to need this, you're going to need that. And I, and, and, and I would hear some people say, well, I don't ever plan on quitting work. I'm going to work the rest of my life. I go, you're dumb. Why would you want to work the rest of your life? I would never tell them that. You don't make sales by telling somebody they're dumb, okay? But in my mind, I'm like, why would you do that? But see, my mindset now, my heart is now, I don't ever plan to retire. For one thing, I don't see how the Word gives me leeway to retire from what I do. And then my dad would say, well, Bob, you really have to have a real job to retire from, you know? <laughs> but the thing is, is that I am and want to be about, just like Pastor Mike, just like Pastor Tim, just like all, the, all of you in here, it doesn't take a pastor in front of your name to be about the Father's business. To be about doing the things that God's called you to do. In Mark 16, he says, that those that believe, how many believers are in here tonight? He says, those that believe, these are the signs that will follow them that believe. It doesn't say those that are pastors, those that are evangelists, those that are prophets. He says, these are the signs that will follow those that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They will stomp on the head. I, I love that last night, Pastor. I never heard that illustration before. I've thought about it that the head we use as a scorpion and the and the serpent is for beat the devil from head to tail. That was great. I'm gonna bet I'm gonna use that somewhere along with your title from that other sermon. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is about these people that are the sheep. They went about doing what was supposed to be done. And the reward was in the fact that they did that. Yeah, it takes faith. It doesn't say there weren't people of faith. It takes people of faith to do the things of God. It takes you saying, okay, I'm going to go do this. For, I'm going to go out and minister in a, uh, on the street to somebody. I'm going to go to the hospital to pray for the sick. 
I'm going to go to the prison and work and, and, and minister to the, to the prison. I'm going to go uh, step up and say God's called me to preach and preach the word. I'm going to go teach a Bible study. I'm going to go start a Bible study in my home to do the work and invite my friends and my family and my neighbors. It takes faith to do those things. But as you do them by faith, you're also doing the works of the kingdom. And you're showing others how to come out of the goat nations. Out of the goat nation, as it were. Into the, into the uh, nation of the sheep. Um, okay. You're fine. Okay. Well, I know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't need it. I didn't need it. You're so fine. Yeah. <laughs> So it takes us doing things. Uh, but I was going to say, yeah, Debbie tells me I'm so fine all the time. But you messed it all up. I don't never, I'll never hear that song again. Right? We'll always be tainted. I'll go, no, turn it off. And James again. Let's go back to James in chapter 3. Um, it's not always about what we're doing. But we have to say the right things, too. Now, one thing that I'm sure all of us are taught in this room is to guard your tongue. But <coughs> oh, wait, here's let me read some, let me read a verse right here. It says, uh, let me find it. it. Says verse six out of chapter three says, "And the tongue is a fire, fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body." Set. No, that's not what I want. Uh, oh, here it is in verse eight. No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now that's not a fun verse, is it? Do you realize that a lot of the verses in the scripture are not real fun when you read them? They don't necessarily make you jump up and go, oh, hello, great, that's great. I'm glad that's good. No, what it's saying here is though, is a challenge. We train ourselves to say what we need to say. Now I do counseling a little bit. And, and in the counseling, I don't know, there's a lot of times where people come in and they say this negative thing about themselves and this negative thing about their situation. And one of the first things I have to do is teach them how to say the right things about their life. Half, more than half the battle is speaking the right words about your life. Um, in our church, we have the, we have the word, Pooey says. It used, she used to be called, now she just called, what is it? Bummer word. Why? Because she will. If you say the wrong thing, she's going to challenge you. Trust me, I live with her. I understand that. I say something wrong. She said, "Really, Bob? You want you want me to agree with you on that, or are you going to retract it?" I retract it every time. Because if I know if she's saying that, I messed up. But the thing is, is how we speak things. You say, "Well, there are me. I'll kick you out of court." Let me tell you a story about it. It just came up, so let me tell you a story. We, we hadn't known each other very well. I was, I was down there, I was preaching in his church that week, and uh, before Word Valley, I, I, uh, my, my transmission of my car broke down in West uh, Kentucky, Western Kentucky. And he had to drive about three hours to come get me, take me back, and I took, took the, my car in to get a transmission fixed that week. And I'm riding back and forth, and so I loaned, he had loaned me his motorcycle. He had a little uh, Harley uh, Sportster, and I'm out riding one day, and all of a sudden, whoop, get a flat tire. So my car's got a transmission problem. I borrowed his motorcycle, it gets a flat tire. And the first question out of his mouth was, are you a tiger? <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to tell you in the trunk, I was going to, I didn't mean that question. I, 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 broke, I called Debbie and said, can I come home? <laughs> so that night, he's taking me back to the church where I was staying in the park they had there in that church. And, and we're driving along, he showed me a country road in the dark, how to get to the church shortcuts. In the dark, right? So, so, so anything, we're driving along, we're talking about sports, and I, I knew he's, he, listen, I, you have to forgive him for this, but he's a Tennessee fan, okay? So my, my I said, you know, I, I have uh, I two, yeah. I have two favorite teams. I said, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. And I knew that would get it. And the unit, and any team that plays Tennessee or beats Tennessee, he's driving and all of a sudden, and I go forward, Patty flies forward with it. She goes, 
Cat, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting him out of my car after he blasphemed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he's getting out of the car. That's a true story. <laughs> James, oh, well, what we say? It's so important what we say. And it's important that we say the right team. You know, Alabama, my granddaughter's going to the University of Alabama this fall. What's the word? Is that roll tide, right? Okay, never mind. Because <laughs> we're teaching. Oh. Huh? Pull the paper roll. <laughs> <laughs> but I told him, I'm going to take, I'm gonna take a, a, a short, I'm going to take a shoot shortcut here again just for a moment. <laughs> And understand that, understand with a shoot shortcut, it's not really a shortcut. It's just a new way to get somewhere that he has never been before, you know? We were going to Gatlinburg one time. Now, have you ever been to the Pigeon Forge Gatlinburg? Okay. And you got that one road, you make that bend, and you're in Gatlinburg, right? Yeah. Well, there's an exit that goes up this mountain to see God. <laughs> just before that bend. So he takes it, we're on motorcycles. I had never ridden in the mountains with my wife on the back of a motorcycle. And she's on, we're on this little sportster. We're going up these hills. We came up to one point where we're going back down, but we came up to a stop sign. It's like this. We're going down the mountain, but it's like this. You stop, dead stop, up like this, and you've got to turn to the left to go up another way from a dead stop. And the only thing I could think of as I sit at that stop sign was, I'm not sure how he's going to do it, but he's going to find a way to get three motorcycles back down this mountain. Back to park. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I told that story out of the shortcut shoot, but it did. I lost it. What we say, how we say it, affects us in every aspect of our life. Now, you can have fun. We can joke. Pastor Jack and I joke, and this is really funny, actually. But it's like, we can joke. Joking's not wrong. Unless it's the expense. We're, we're, we're bantering back and forth, but we, we respect one another. We love one another. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing you learn is that when you speak, you speak by faith. <laughs> and being a friend of his, you have to have a lot of words of faith to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. 
and then I had yeah. Satan attacks and blah blah blah. So then this is a kind of a new Christian in a sense, but then what you know, he's saying like, is is pray according with the Lord. Now right. now and what I would give you some prayers here out of Ephesians. There's about yeah. three of them in the beginning of Ephesians. Okay. And you apply those and you put those in in, in, in the same prayer that you just in, 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 in other words, where it says this, that you put your name. In other words, you insert yes, your I name those, okay, so I that you might be a, a, agreeing with the word. Okay. And so the, I was just more like, you know, what I added in What I would say is that you're uh, possibly, possibly uh, concerned with something that's not even going on in your life here. So what I would say is, well, so he said, and it just stay, if you stay with the, with the word. If the word says it, and I can exactly. The word is the Bible. Well, yeah, yeah. But I don't know what the word is. And I wonder, but I am confused. You confused about things. Well, no, no, no. Clarity comes with more exposure. Right. Well, I just like, okay, does anybody remember anything about the lying down for him? It's not in the sign of the Bible. There's a lot of word out there. A lot of people that of religion as well. Yeah. And that's the reason why the more familiar you become with the word. And and, and how do you do it? Yeah, yeah, you read it. You read it? You, read it, yep. you spend time meditating yep. on it. Exactly. You, you don't just read it and say, okay, zip through this chapter. You, 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 you camp out in it. Okay? Yes. Like the only thing I could ever read for the longest time in my whole life, Revelation. So for me, I always had to read it for the You're the best of times. Yeah. And the, the, uh, and to steal Charles. To steal Charles Dickens' quote out of the book Twin uh, Tale of Two Cities is you're the best of times and worst of times. Worst of times is right now. We look out there and see the worst of times. But in the kingdom, you're in the best of times. You're right where we need right. to be. How you train yourself is you study the word. You go you, when you're in service. You go to go to a church that teaches the word, not doctrine, not messing me up like that. That's where I'm more confused with what church I belong in to help me go on. Okay. You live in Pekin. This, yeah, and I've been to this church a few times. I'm just not. Sh I just. Oh, but you live in Pekin. <laughs> okay. Right. I don't mind going to many different churches. But I like to take. That would confuse you. That would. Yes. Need to be right here. Okay. Need to be right here with this guy right here. Because he will take you the right direction. Okay. Okay. If you lived in Bloomington, I'd say you go with that guy right over there. If you lived in the Morton area, I'd say go with our church. But since you're in Pekin, you need to be right here because this man will teach you the word. And that's what you need. Your own personal study. and Because it, 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 it is important when you go to church. Me on the way, and then I got a little more confused and I have some stuff about well, well, we'll talk to you afterwards. Okay? Sorry. But, no, no, that's good because it is important what we say. And that's, that, that, the, the difference in tonight, yeah. yeah so the difference tonight, we're, we're trying to teach, so I, I don't mind the openness. I don't mind the questions. That's, that's why. Okay, well. She's my driver. That's my wife right there. Uh-huh. Remember this, Pastor Mike? You know her? I okay, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Just get with him, call him up, and say, hey, can I meet with you and Rachel? And, okay, yeah, you know, yeah, so I just, like, I just yeah, yeah, so Call him up and say, I'm in Morton, but he's in Beacon. Which church? Grace Fellowship. Grace Fellowship. Grace Fellowship. So, what's the address? The address is 1937 South Main Street. We're in the Field Shopping Center. Um, but but it's, it's, as we learn, as we learn how to speak, a lot of life changes. I, we were Christian a long time. Christians a long time, and Pastor Jack and Patty probably say the same thing, and Pastor Mike probably too, was that we learned a lot of religion at times. You guys didn't really came under Pastor Mike right away, did you? No, we were a couple years later. So it's like you, you, we learned one thing, but we realized that wasn't what we we're supposed to be doing. What we need to learn to do is speak according to the word, always using the word as our our, our point of, of contact with the Lord and with with man. When someone comes to see you and they need to, they need to have a, 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 a question, they have a question for you, then you need to have the right to, you have the ability to speak the right word to them. How does that happen? How does it happen? Getting into, your, getting into the word yourself, studying it, so that you can speak to them. You change your atmosphere. Yes. You change your day, your life, by how you speak. 
And so it's a matter of understanding that it's not going to change overnight either. Well, that sounded negative, Pastor Bob. No, I'm saying it takes time to retrain, to tame that tongue that the Word says, that James says, is an unruly instrument. You have to harness it. It's like a horse. I was saying about this. I watched Secretary the other night. And I was saying about this as a horse. I wish Rob was here for tell the story. It would be a lot more fun. Because you think horses can Sorry. be tamed, right? Huh? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tamed, right? Am I right? Yeah. Now you get on, I, we went to, uh, the whole family went on a trip one time and they decided to go for horseback riding. On tame horses, right? On these trails. Well, Rob's horse was so tame, it decided, now it was the perfect horse for Rob because it argued with him. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> with my son? And Rob, Rob will not go horseback riding again because that horse was taking control of Rob and it was tame. In other words, it should have been obeying the rider, am I correct? Correct. Your tongue may seem tamed at times, and it should be obeying what you said, but you still got to harness it. You've got to show it you're in control. You're the boss of what's coming out of your mouth. And when you say something wrong, don't get all defeated and say, oh man, what did I do? No. Just step back. I didn't mean it like that. You track it. I repent of that statement. Step back and say it correctly. Correct yourself. Okay? And don't have a brother Fraser. That horse beat Rob. I'll tell you right now. I wish I was hoping, you know, not that <laughs> Go ahead. I went to Ezekiel 47. I'm reading there alone. 
And Ezekiel 47, we're going to read through the whole passage. It's about Ezekiel has a visitation or a vision where God shows him a river coming out from the temple. And the further you go from the temple, the deeper the waters get. He measured out a thousand cubits, water to the ankles, another thousand water to the knees and to the, to the loins. Then risen waters, waters to swim in. You've heard this before, right? And then it starts talking about this river. Wherever it goes, restoration takes place. That they go into the desert places, and this river virtually bursts new growth where there hadn't been any. And I'm reading this, and God came in the room as I'm reading it and started speaking to me. And he says, you know that desire you've always had to be a pioneer to discover? I said, yes. He says, I put that in you. Anybody else ever want to be a pioneer want to discover things? Amen. Amen. And God, this, this changed the course of my life. He said, if you will trust me and follow me, I'm going to allow you to pioneer the river of God and be poured out in the end times. Amen. And it set my course. Whatever you want me to do, God, let's do it. Let's go pioneer. And then later in 2010, he told me, I'm showing you stuff out of the Word that people have never seen before. I'm making you a trouble or drop from the waters. If you just trust me, you'll change the course of events in the world. And God's calling us to be world changers. Yes. Yes. To pioneer this glory being poured out that nobody has ever experienced before. This Ezekiel 47 has never been fulfilled. It's for the end times like the earth being filled with glory. And you may think, well, I live in Peak and I live around this area. What am I going to do? If you trust God and go after Him, He's going to do something in your life that nobody else in the world is qualified to do or is going to be able to do. And you're going to change the course of events all of eternity. And that's what quickening, I believe, is about. To get you to really believe that God can do something majestic with your life. And I believe He can. I believe He wants to. And if you let Him, He will. Yeah. Amen? Amen. In John, uh, chapter, I think it's chapter uh, 7, yeah, it is. It says that, uh, John writes here again, he says, uh, on, the, on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers, with rivers of living water. Out of, you become a living water, just like here. And the thing is, is we, we talked about the fact that you need to you need to do, do things for the kingdom. You need to be about work. You need to be doing about the work of the, the, the business of God. Then how you say things also sets the pace for you. But what you say, well, if you say, I can't do that, you don't understand, Pastor Bob, I, I, I can't preach. I, you don't understand, Pastor Bob, I, I, can't, I can't teach. Well, I've had just about everybody in our church say that to me. And just about everybody in our church preaches and teaches now. Why? Because I know that the ability to do what they, God is asking them to do is already there. They have that river living water. Pastor Vince uh, was 15 years old. He got saved. Pastor Vince went through some rough, rough waters. Am I correct over the years? But he had to write a Kawasaki. He had to write a Kawasaki for a while. That's right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that rough water. But the thing is, is preach today, or hear him teach today, he has a knowledge that's so rich and deep and a steadfast and white, because he trained himself, first off, he stepped out of the problem area, he said, you know what, he took God's word for its word, and said, I'm going to apply it to my life, I'm going to use it the way God said I can use it, and he said, and so he stepped out, he started saying the right things about what he was reading in the Word, right things about himself, right things about his life, right things about where God's taking him tomorrow. And it started happening because he was saying the right things. So he started doing things, he started saying things. And right now, beloved, like the Word in James here, it says, um, Come now, uh, let's see here, right? James 13, verse 13 says this, Come now. You say to, to, to today or tomorrow, I think one of you guys said that 
Pastor Jim, Tim said that last night. Well, why, why are you waiting for the healing tomorrow? Because tomorrow now becomes now. He says, so those of you say, uh, I'm going to, to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit, uh, whereas uh, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's a vapor. Now, why do I want to say that? And, and, and then closes off in that, that section says, Therefore, to him who knows good and does not do it, to him is sin. What is that saying? It's saying if you first have to realize that your life is a vapor. Now, it's not negative. Life is a vapor. Pastor Jack didn't know he was going to be this old this fast. <laughs> what? <laughs> It's like a vapor. So we have a limited time. We have a, li a limited time to get accomplish what God's called us to do. I don't care if you're Caleb, who's what? 10? 11? 12. 12. <laughs> about seeing the things of God and he wants to do things for the kingdom. So, limited time. Doesn't matter whether you're Pastor Jack's age or you're Caleb's age. There's a limited amount of time to get what needs to be done, done. God wants us doing the things for the kingdom growth. We're not just supposed to have a, uh, what's the old saying, Pastor Mike, uh, us for no more, uh, a bless me club, all those other things that justifies small gatherings. I'm not after a big church. I'll be honest with you. That's not. I want a strong, thriving church that affects the nation. Amen. I want people in the church that I know that can change another person's life where they work. So you don't have to get up and preach to do that. You don't have to have a pastor title for your name or those. Is you just get up and do what God's called you to do. And we're all called to do something for the kingdom. Each one of us has a unique gift, so unique it's like your fingerprints. I can't be Pastor Jack, nor would I want to be, but I can't be him. I, he can't be me, nor would he want to be. Because that... <laughs> you know, it was her husband earlier. It's nice to be loved by your people. <laughs> the thing is, is that all, I'm, all I wanted to do tonight, the whole intent of this, and Pastor Jack brought in the, the fact of the glory, living in glory, the, and, and, and that river, and, and, and other great things. It's like, I wanted to get across one thing, and that was to stop saying you can't do things. I used to tell my wife, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do that. I can't, you, you understand that, I can't saw a board, a straight line. You understand that? I can't hammer that nail. Then Pastor Joe came along last year and ruined it all for me, taught me how to do that. I can't say that anymore, nor do I want to. Quit saying, I can't do that. Step out by faith and do the work of the kingdom. And realize time's short. Time is short. We need to be going about the Father's business, doing it with all that we've got every day of our lives. We all, all of us in this building work at something one way or another. Even those on Social Security work at something every day. How's it, how, in, 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 uh, in their home, in their yard, you're working at something. You don't have to have a job that you get paid for to be considered a worker. We all work. We all have lives. But the key and the center point of your life and everything you do should be focused on what can I do today to change the world for the kingdom of God. To bring the glory in. It's not, nobody's going to do it but us, beloved. Nobody's going to get that accomplished but the end time church. I was thinking when you said people in your church said they can't preach, but now they all do. I was reading my wife's mind and she was thinking, I'm glad I don't go to Pastor Bob. I agree with what he said. He never said can't. I refuse that word in my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I'm thinking how you 
you stumble that just going up over the hill on a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. 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 I saw God. Oh. <laughs> Pastor Carter and I both said we saw God that day. And he was laughing at us. Why are you following that guy? <laughs> I, I want to I clarify, not clarify, but add to something. Uh, I believe we're all to be evangelists. We're all to be involved in the gospel. But there are different callings and giftings. I heard, a, I heard an individual, uh, my goodness, probably been nearly 30 years ago, a minister came to our church and that I was attending, Pastor Cowan's church, and he started talking about how he leads two people to God every day. Two people he leads to the cross every day. And we all should be doing leading at least two people to Jesus every day. Well, he was a natural evangelist. It came easy to him. It didn't come easy to me. I street witnessed. I did a lot of street witnessing. I've witnessed in the nursing homes and the jails, but it's not my natural inclination to evangelize. I'm more of a geek type of personality. <laughs> Pastor Lee Fields, he knows everybody. He, every, he just tells everybody about Jesus. You, you, be willing to do anything, but still recognize you don't have to do everything. Find your giftings, your talents, your, 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 your calling, and Seek to maximize your effectiveness in that. Yes. When I discovered, because see, I used to think I had to do it all. I had to be an evangelist. I had to work in an evangelist. I had to, I had to you know, try to do every single area of Christianity until I found out I wasn't, that wasn't my calling, my gifting. So what I did, I poured myself into what it is my calling, to teach the Word. Yes. So I spent almost all my time studying the Word, meditating, teaching, and I'll let the people that are qualified to be evangelists do the evangelism. But what I do is I let my life evangelize. You follow me? I'll let my walk talk for me. And then when somebody, somebody says, well, how did you get like that? Because I'm not who I used to be. She's definitely not who she used to be. Please change a little bit. Is that I can tell them the word that changed me. Yes. Yes. So find out what God's gifted you in. There are tests you can take. There are, there are tests online you can take to find out where your inclinations are. Talk to your pastor about it. Find out where he sees your giftings. And then seek to use those to God's glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that, just to uh, key off of that too, and I know that's what I meant was, not everybody's the same. You have a you have a unique gift that has a fingerprint, just like you, just as unique as your fingerprint. Pastor Jack and I are both teachers, we're both preachers, but we're different. We do it differently. We have a different approach. We have a different we have a different call to our area. The whole thing. But that's the uniqueness of that fingerprint. Um, Patty and Debbie have callings on their lives. They're unique. And they're, 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 it's different. And I used to kick myself too about eventually. I need to go out there winning some. No, that's not who I am. I'm a teacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. There's a difference. Um, but there are evangelists in our church. There are evangelists in, our, in, in the area that I can say, hey, you know, can you go over and do this or whatever? You know, and I'm going to, Martin Luther King had, had a quote way back in, um, actually you can change it up. I'm going to read a person to change it up a little bit. It says, it says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. So you can't preach, then teach. Can't teach, then go on. Uh, share. But whatever you're doing, keep moving forward in the kingdom because that's why you're here. I used to say, and I, uh, uh, some of us really, I guess I sort of, I say, you know, I always think sort of dumb, but you know, if God didn't need you here, the day you went under to get baptized, Preacher could have held you under, and you could have been in heaven that day. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but the deal is, God needs you here. And, here, and one, thing, one thing I did learn, and most of you know this, but I just shared, Pastor Jack and I were going back to Ghana uh, with Pastor Jim. But the last time I was with him, and Pastor Jack, you've been back, what, three times since we went? Twice since Twice, we twice since we Stayed an extra week. And went two times. That's right. And it's like, um, when... When we went over there, um, 
we could tell that there was a calling to that place, you know, in all of us. And I believe that he didn't sense it on him as much as it really was on him. But being a missionary, but being a missionary is not necessarily my calling, but it's something that I want to do in the kingdom. I don't want to, I'm not called to be a missionary, but I'm called to teach. I'm called to teach wherever I go. Now, Pastor Mike and, and, and Rachel have been in the mission field. They went to South Africa. They went to the luxury part of Africa. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, uh, but, but, but they, I know Rachel has a strong feeling towards Africa, towards Africa, and towards missions. And that's a calling in her, okay? That's, that's, that's a gift that's, that's going to rise in her. But you can't look at somebody else and say, well, I wish I could do that. Find out who you are, God. Find out how he wants to use you. And when you do that, that's when the peace of God just falls on you and you can relax. I love what I do for, I love counseling. Um, there are days I, it's, it's, it's brutal, there's days that I don't, uh, I just don't want to take any more negativity, but when I get up and I don't feel like going, I get up and go because that's what I do. And when I get in there, there's a peace that falls on me. Is it a regular yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Just, that makes sense. Yeah. The, what I want to think is when I get into that situation, I relax. It's not work. Matter of fact, I feel guilty taking, not too guilty, but I feel guilty taking the money. <laughs> I'm real guilty. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it's not working. That's what I'm talking about. When you get into the kingdom and you're doing your call, don't say, well, I don't know what it is. You're not going to know what it is sitting here doing, just twiddling your thumbs. Just like you didn't know what you were going to do for a life work until you stepped out and did it, right? Yeah. Until you stepped out and did the training that was needed. Deb is a nurse. And I remember the minute when she went into nursing, it was a matter of, well, I don't know. But she stepped out and did it. And then she found out and asked what she was supposed to do. All we're doing tonight, hopefully all we're trying to get you to do tonight, is that you heard about the glorious church, the victorious church, and that doesn't happen unless you do what you're supposed to do. You quit listening to the negativities, you quit listening to all the, all the problems that everybody's having, and you start following after the things of God. You start studying the Word like you've never studied it before. You get a hold of the Word and quit and lay aside man's doctrines. Because it's the word that will set you free. It's the word that will spur you on. It's the word of God that will change your life to where the I can'ts are no longer there. And it's the word of God. That's what will cause us to be sheep rather than those. That's what will cause us to live victorious and glorious and see the glory fulfilled. And usher in, as Pastor Jack said, the glory of God. Now, I want to pray for you tonight. If you're here and you would like to, I'm not, Pastor, Pastor.